Good morning and welcome everyone to the fifth meeting of the Local Government and Communities Committee in 2018. Can I remind everyone present to turn off mobile phones and as meeting papers are provided in a digital format, tablets may be used by <coughs> members during the meeting. We've had one apology uh, for today's meeting, unfortunately Kenneth Gibson, the MSP, is unable to come along, but I'm delighted to see that David Torrance, the MSP, is here as a substitute member in his place. Um, David, because you haven't been to this committee before as, as a member, uh, you have to declare any relevant interest you feel be appropriate to put on the record at this point before we move to agenda item one. So can I give you the opportunity to do that now? Thank you, convener, and I have nothing to declare. Well, that was brief. Uh, thank you. Um, so we will now move to agenda item one. Uh, and the committee will take evidence on the Electoral Commission's report on the Scottish Council elections 2017. And can I welcome Dame Susan Bruce, the Commissioner, and Daniel Head and Sarah Mackey, Senior Officer of the Electoral Commission Scotland. Welcome all three of you uh, for coming along. Um, and can I ask the Commissioner to make a short opening statement? Thank you very much and thanks for the opportunity to um, give evidence uh, today. The, the report on the um, local Council elections last year was published and I'm pleased to be able to report that the elections were um, well run and commanded um, high levels of voter confidence and satisfaction and that we think is down to the hard work of the returning officers, electoral registration officers and the electoral management board who at that time also faced the additional challenge of um, planning, planning the unexpectedly um, run general election immediately um, afterwards. I think the ability to deliver council elections successfully as they did and to increase the engagement of voters um, demonstrates the strength of the electoral community in Scotland and by that I also include uh, the parties and the policy makers in that group. So um, strength in depth in understanding what the election meant. We were pleased to be able to report that turnout had risen by over 7% since uh, 2012 to 46.9%, which actually was the best turnout since 1977. However, at 46.9%, um, that is still less than half of those eligible to vote. So there is still work to do there in engaging um, the electorate um, and encouraging their participation. Um, whilst the general picture was positive, and you'll have seen in the report, we have made a series of recommendations to make improvements to the running of the polls and to better support the participation of voters and candidates um, during the election. Just um, a couple of other issues. You'll be aware that the Scottish Government has now published its consultation on electoral reform, and we're very much engaged in that and are working on our response at this time. And finally, I just wanted to note um, the fact that Scotland Act 2016 um, makes the Commission accountable to the Scottish Parliament for our work on Scottish parliamentary elections, as we already are for council elections. And... Uh, I just wanted to put on record that we value that accountability to the Parliament and look forward to working um, closely with you. Thank you. Very helpful. Thank, thank you for that. I might open up with some general questions, then we'll move to members for some more, more detailed uh, questioning. Um, in terms of, of, of turnout, would you think there's a, a general trend that following the Scottish independence referendum, there's, there's, what I'm trying to say is, is this turnout... Is it the referendum bounce or are there other factors going on? Because if it's a referendum bounce, irrespective of people's views in the constitution, that, 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 that might subside again. So what, what are your thoughts on whether this is a, re, a gradual realignment of turnout to increased levels, still pretty low in some places, or, or, or whether it's a, a kind of, is, is it a false hope that this is a general trajectory that will continue? I think, um, I mean, the Scottish referendum did see really record levels of turnout and I think what was really encouraging there was the engagement of 16 and 17 year olds and their participation um, in that particular um, piece of, um, well, in the referendum. And what we have been at pains to point out to ourselves and to our colleagues in the electoral um, registration offices, ROs and the EMB and so on, work with them, is to not take that for granted. Um, and particularly now, we're seeing quite a long space between electoral events. So we're going to have to work hard to make sure that information is made available and there's plenty of engagement with um, the public in general. Um, I think it has been the fact that older voters tend to, once they've started voting, they tend to continue to vote. And what we've been trying to do um, with colleagues, particularly in the electoral registration office, is to capture the interests of people who have never registered before, to encourage them to register, to understand the value of their vote, and to um, continue with the awareness raising campaigns. I don't know, if, Andy, if you've got anything to add to that. 
I mean, yeah. I mean, in a sense, we're not about turnout uh, and vote. I think we think, although it's not really anything to do with us, uh, voters vote if they think it's important enough, and that's why you get 85% in independence yeah. referendums and you get less in lower tier elections, as academics would call them. Uh, I mean, we were higher than England and Wales at the UK parliamentary in 2015, but we were lower in 2017, which was only a month after uh, the council elections, which was the, the highest since 77 as standalone council election. I mean, what we're really interested in is making sure that pe people are engaged, understand how to register, uh, and can fill in the ballot papers. And I think there are a number of issues at the council election, uh, which you'll no doubt want to raise with us about how, how, to, how to vote uh, and uh, how to vote correctly. Which is a nice lead on, because that, that's actually the line of question I, I wanted to follow. I remember when the um, Electoral Commission for Scotland has given evidence to the committee before, and we will, and we quite rightly should go through various groups in society and protected characteristics and how they're engaging with the system. We will do all that. We really should do. But I remember having a theme saying the biggest inequality that seems to appear in voter turnout figures and spoiled paper figures is by geographic location and by poverty and deprivation. Um, so, for example, Canal Ward uh, in, in, in Glasgow is, is in my constituency of Mary Hill and Springburn, had uh, the highest, I think, spoiled papers um, uh, across Scotland. And previously, I, I don't think that I think the Electoral Commission was aware that these things were going on. But there's a recommendation now to say that where we know there's likely to be there's evidence there's significant long-term trends for more spoiled papers by percentage in areas for work to begin a year before the next election, two years, three years, more information on the day of the election, more officers. What, what would that look like? Because there's a recommendation there, isn't there, for, 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 for government to look at in terms of how we, how we manage that. So with my, my ward, Canal Ward, should we expect, I suppose, uh, to see a huge information education campaign two years before the next council election? Should we be getting extra money for our schools, for doing the educational, for the third sector, for, for hard-to-reach groups? What would that look like in practice? Because when you look at uh, a, northern, a North Isles ward in Orkney, it's 0.47% spoiled papers, and my ward of Canal of 5.67%. That's a huge differential and a huge inequality. Yeah, and, and particularly where a mile away from Canal, um, in one of that, it was a hill head or something like that, you had less than 1%, you know, you know so it's, it's two places cheap by jowl with such a disparate, you know, uh, discrepancy. Um, one of the things we looked at is, is there, there's a few issues going along on with the number of spoilt ballots. Um, so we did some analysis of it and we, um, and we looked at things like educational attainment, um, social renting, um, private renting, um, different issues like that. And the one that came out clearly uh, that correlated with it was um, deprivation and unemployment, but none of the others did. So that's clearly an issue. However, we also found that you were much more likely to have spoilt ballots in wards where parties were standing multiple candidates. And the biggest cause of the spoilt ballots was where people have voted XXX. So they've looked for their party that they like, and they've seen they've got three candidates, and they've just put an X by all three. So that's so that's obviously you know a big issue as well. Also we found the longer the ballot paper, the more names on the ballot paper, the higher the risk of of the, it being rejected. But yeah, we have made a recommendation that, that you know having done that analysis, we can predict where we are likely to have higher rates of spoilt ballots. So that is very much about information in the polling station. Also looking at the postal voting packs in those wards and try and see can we make it more clear it's also about um yes work in schools and you know through the local media um, and the thing with our campaigns is we found out if you start them the information campaigns too far out from the election people kind of turn off there is kind of an optimum time about six weeks before so i think what you would look at is put more resources into those six weeks than kind of have less resource the, the same resource spread out over a year. That, I think that would be the way we would go. Mm -hmm. But we have recommended that returning officers identify which wards are at risk. Um, also, because you can have, we did find you might have a ward with deprivation, but if there wasn't multiple candidates standing from a party, they didn't get the same high rate. So you'll only obviously know when nominations close how many, the full risk 
of, of rejected ballots. And, and could we listen? I, I know you said you're not, you want to boost turnout, but turnout is everyone's responsibility. Um, but is there, is there a double whammy for some deprived communities where they're getting significantly increased percentages of spoiled ballot papers and significantly lower levels of turnout to begin, to begin with? So should a correlation be done there in identifying wards where you have high spoiled papers and low yeah. turnout to see actually that needs even more support yeah. there? Yeah. I mean, it, when you have places where people don't turn out, so you're looking at places like Shettleston, and, and I was at the Glasgow count and I saw the amount of double X's that were appearing on the Shettleston ballot papers and being discounted. And when you've managed to get people to turn out, those few people, and then they've had their, you know, what I think was 4% in Shettleston, you know, that's very disappointing. And yes, you know, we would agree that you need to target those wards particularly. So more information, well-trained confident information officers yep. within the polling stations, just as a courtesy saying to people, just a wee reminder, uh, it's numbers here, it's one, two, three, no X's, please, just that wee courtesy yeah. reminder, yeah, the human touch at the point just before they've cast the vote, that's resource intensive, but is that the kind of thing at the end of a six weeks process? I mean, that's the sort of thing we're looking at. I mean, to be fair to the return officers, they, they do do this training currently, although uh, when you talk to deputy return officers and return officers, some of them are concerned about the actual uh, employment of the training uh, on the day and the consistency of the message. And I think they've taken it away and the Electoral Management Board will make sure in 2022 that they, they prosecute the policy in terms of doing all of this. I think there's also an element for the parties to be more consistent about their messaging. Mm -hmm. Uh, about how you fill in the ballot paper, which we've worked with the party, all the parties over the years. Uh, some of them do it better than others. Uh, I think there's also an element of, you certainly see this in by-elections, as we call it, the three in the three box, where you, g you get a, nu a number three, which isn't counted as a valid vote, whereas an X would be if it's only one X. And just a, a casual remark, I'm third on the ballot paper, or just put an X, it'll be fine because they'll count it. They'll count it if it's one X, but they'll not if someone else says, and vote for me, and then you get the kind of thought processes of the voter and you suddenly get two Xs. So I think we've all got to be very careful about how we consistently deliver the correct message of how you fill in the, the ballot paper. OK, final question for myself before um, some other members come in. Now, I just mentioned this line of questioning briefly because others may want to come to it in more detail. I'm certainly a strong supporter. I think it's unarguable to say that we should be going to some form of randomised ballot papers, and I say that as a Bob Doris, who does we do quite well out of an alphabetised system. Um, and parties do quite well as well, because it allows them to really to have a lot more control over how they do voter management strategies and the like also, try to maximise the amount of candidates. But if we did move to randomised ballot papers, uh, proportionate prints based in um, the various... Uh, con uh, combinations of, of candidates on the paper, that could confuse voters even more as they try to seek out their preferred candidate from their preferred party. So whilst I would, and we'll come on to that later, no doubt, I would support randomised ballot papers to put fairness into the system for all candidates. Is there a negative to that in terms of uh, potential spoiled papers and just confusing the electorate? I think, I mean, you've read our report, we do recognise that there is an alphabet, there seems to be an alphabetic discrimination uh, occurring. Uh, and it, it, its impact varies between the parties. I mean, the SNP, 78% of cases where you stood more than two candidates, the first candidate, the odd Vork, got the, the, the vote rather than Zebedee, Mr Zebedee or whatever you want to call them. Uh, and that varies and such. Our concern, I mean, there are solutions to all of this. There's A to Z, Z to A, there's rotation, there's discrimination by lot, I suppose. Our concern is the law of unintended consequence and how that impacts on the voter, because we're obviously all about the voter. So our argument is we should test it. If we are going to change the ballot paper, uh, and we're not really aware of anything where a voter gets something in a list which isn't alphabetic, we don't know. Uh, it may be a solution, it may not. I think there's also, if you look at, if you leave it as the status quo, there's also an argument which says, and we held an, a, a, a conference to engage people on the consultation with Glasgow University a couple of weeks back, and people were articulating things like, 
actually you could leave it as it was, but you could increase, uh, do better vote management strategies by the parties uh, to ensure that you, 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 you say where you want one, two for Zebedee and Aardvark or two, one and whatever. So there's kind of there's many ways, but what we're saying is whatever we do, we need to test it first. Yeah, and it's worth pointing out that if I recall, the predecessor committee of the committee that I now share did an inquiry into this as well, and they recommended that some some pilot initiative should take place at elections, um, and it's something this committee hasn't particularly looked at yet, and we might want to give consideration to. But we should note the predecessor committee did recommend that. Is that something you'd be supportive of? So, see, pick pick half a dozen council wards and pilot it, if that was possible. You would probably have to do that in 2022, because the effect occurs where you've got more than one candidate from the same party. And since 2007, I think from then we've only had two double vacancies at the same on the same day on the same ballot paper. Mm -hmm. So if you were going to do it in a by-election, you're basically waiting for the councillor boss to go off the cliff, uh, sort of thing, uh, to get lots of <laughs> it, it really... So I, I used to work in local government, so you know, I used to go on <laughs> councillor visits and such. Uh, the, I think it's probably easier to do to test where we've t we've tested ballot papers before and you do you get people to fill in a range of ballot papers and then talk to them interview them over a long period of time uh, or do focus groups on it so you can actually try and figure out what you're seeing and the reasons for it so we've actually got the perfect opportunity now haven't we with with 2022 lots of opportunities to do some market research to to trial some ballot papers and controlled circumstances and then potentially have a go live pilot in 2022 that's that's absolute uh, we, all the other members i should point out that some of the other members are councillors that were previously councillors that could have been on that bus that you referred to mr o'neill so good luck with the line of questioning you get in relation to that uh, but thank you for that we'll move to jenny gilruth next you can be there and just to clarify i was never a councillor and um, in your report one of your, your recommendations is a consideration of how to engage young people who will reach the age of electoral majority i.e will turn 16 before 2021 in the next four years. And you also talk about working with educational partners in order to do that in terms of supporting political literacy in schools. Now, I know in 2014 you did similar work. Um, what is going to be different this time? And will you look to work with uh, EROs in terms of voter registration more specifically? Yes, I think, um, I mean... We do need to look at ways across the board that we can uh, work. And actually, we were just having a discussion about this uh, yesterday, in fact, about if you focus efforts on, say, modern studies courses, you get young people who are not necessarily following that course through school, so they might be excluded from that type of education. So engaging across the board with directors of education, with local authorities, with youth groups, with organisations like Young Scott to um, raise awareness, all of that, I think, will... Um, be incredibly helpful. I don't know, Andy, do you want to... Sorry. What we've done for the last two years, so preceding the Scottish Parliament election and the local government election, is we have worked with all of the local authorities in Scotland and the directors of education um, and the chief execs of the councils um, to get schools signed up to do a, what we called a ready-to-vote yeah. event. Mm -hmm. um, so this year we did it on the 1st of March and... We've, we've pretty much named and shamed local authorities by putting a table on the website which showed how many schools had signed up. And then you had that kind of domino effect as more and more signed up, those that weren't there became a bit embarrassed and signed up. So that worked very well. And we got over 80% of mm. secondary schools in Scotland taking part in that and doing something with, their, with the young people who would be eligible to vote at the forthcoming election. But what we did find, it was very hard to carve time out of the school year because they're approaching exams at that point in time. Um, so it was difficult to get some schools to give up that time. And, and you can understand if, the, if it's the young people's electoral, you know, exam success yeah. that's in jeopardy, you, could, you can understand that. So what we're looking at in the next few years is rather than having them do an event, is looking at developing resources that could be used in school. We're thinking potentially as part of citizenship might be Kind of, or personal and social education might fit across the board and then all young people would do it. We're getting, um, in March, meeting, there's a group of academics with an interest in this area who have been developing resources. So we're going to meet with them in March and also be talking to Education Scotland to see if we can get something. So it becomes a routine part of a young person's development in school that they have. On that point, actually, um, I wasn't a counsellor, but I was a modern studies teacher. So I know that until the end of SC, there should be a level of political education that every child experiences irrelevant of whether they take modern studies. So 
80% of schools signed up to your uh, ready to vote programme. What about that 20%? You talked about, you know, naming and shaming them as it were. Now, going back to 2012, I know there was a social studies impact report that Education Scotland carried out, which said that 20% of schools in Scotland don't teach modern studies. Is there a connect then between the schools that don't teach the subject and also haven't signed up to your ready to vote campaign? Are they just not engaging? Is it cultural what's going on yeah. there i mean that, that's possible we, we haven't what we haven't done is gone through the list of schools that haven't signed up and seen you know what have they got modern studies i know certainly um there were modern studies we, we launched it in um, govan high school two years ago before mm-hmm. scottish parliament elections and it was the modern studies class that kind of worked as peer educators and went yeah. out and, and delivered the sessions with mm-hmm. the other young people so i think and i have that uh, um when the teachers signed up, there was a high level of modern studies teachers amongst yeah. the names that we saw. So there possibly is a link with that. So, I mean, that's something, because what we want to do is maybe talk to the Modern Studies Association as well about how we can get this into schools and, you know, into, embedded into the political literacy in schools. Um, but we'll look at what's happening in the schools without modern studies. And yeah, see. I mean, do you think the government needs to look again at how schools are actually delivering the curriculum? Because my concern, certainly, as a, as a modern studies teacher, was that there were certain parts of the country, and I think Angus is one of them, that were just not delivering modern studies for whatever reason, and they could not provide evidence at the time to Education Scotland of how it was being delivered in the curriculum elsewhere. So the argument was always put that, whilst we might not deliver modern studies, the, the children can experience these experiences and outcomes within that curriculum area because uh, they might be getting taught history or geography or somebody else will deliver it to them but they couldn't provide any substantive evidence to that effect is that the kind of work you might do with the government in the future or with education scotland to track and monitor what schools are actually delivering to ensure that all kids across scotland get a consistent delivery in terms of political literacy education i think the sorry sarah i think the um education scotland would clearly have a lead role in that yeah i think as the electoral commission our role would be in providing as much evidence as we could to them to to link um young people's engagement and understanding of electoral matters. Mm -hmm. But we wouldn't take a role in in influencing um, how much time was spent on the curriculum in that. I think that's very much in the ballpark Mm -hmm. of Education Scotland. We could certainly be a resource there, provide them with with evidence to um, support any work going forward. Mm -hmm. I think the main thing is, and if you tie up that with the the previous question about um, the rejection rates Mm -hmm in certain constituencies, Mm -hmm. we would need to um, try and give as much information as possible to ensure that people, whatever age they were, in those um, areas had the best possible um, chance of participating. Mm -hmm. And I think if we can get as much useful information to young people before they start voting and get them into the habit of voting, they're more likely to stay in the habit of voting. So I think it's a really important thing to look at. And on a positive note, what we did find was the 16, 17 year olds that we surveyed after the election said that they that they were much more likely to report finding it easy to access information about how to register and how to vote mm-hmm. than the 18 to 25 year olds. Um, so getting that information to them in school, mm-hmm. recognising there, there are more schools that we need to reach, um, does seem to be having a positive effect. Mm-hmm. Uh, have you done any, sorry, just as a final point on this, have you done any supplementary work with regard to how effective pupil councils are and how that impacts upon uh, engagement later in life? Is that something that you've looked at? Because I know from my own constituency, I've been going around and looking at pupil councils. Some of them are more effective than others. Some of them, children have a real voice in that school. And I think that impacts upon whether or not they engage in the political process later in life. Is that something that you know the commission's looked at? or It's not something we've looked at in any depth. Um, yep. But I do think it sounds very interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, and... Certainly, I've had experience, I think it's in West Lothian, there was a very dedicated community education worker there who was very um, determined to kind of increase pe- young people's political engagement. And he used to oversee all of the pupil council elections in the school. And he would go in and he would get the, the elections team involved and they would run them as proper elections. The mm-hmm. young people had to sign up onto the electoral register for them. And I think the really positive thing was that it was, it was a properly run election and it had a proper output, yeah. as in elected mm-hmm. representatives. You know, because a lot of people go down the mock election route. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I, I think, of you know, the, the pupil council thing, for me, feels like a much more mm-hmm. educational thing about the whole democratic mm-hmm. kind of space. Yeah. OK, thank you. OK, thank you. Andy Whiteman. Yeah, thanks very much, convener. Um, you said in o- opening, um, Susan Bruce, that when people start to vote, they tend to continue to vote. Is, is there good evidence for that, or is that just anecdotal? It's... Um, the evidence is that we have, in terms of voter turnout, um, 
where there are high areas of turnout, there tends to be an older population who have started to vote and have continued to vote. What we have found out is that people who have never registered and they're maybe in their 30s or 40s, they're the most difficult ones to get <coughs> into the habit of voting. And the, um, the impact, going back to the first question of the referendum, the, the increase in the number of people who joined the register at that time who'd never been on the register, and some of them were in their, quite a large number of them were in their 30s and 40s. Um, the hope would be that those individuals would, would continue to join, um, you know, continuous voters, having experienced it once, realised that they could do it, they could understand it, it was accessible to them. So I think there's a range of, of, um, of messages that we have to get out in relation to that. I would defer to Andy and Sarah for the historic evidence on that. I think because obviously there's limited countries where 16-year-olds yeah. are entitled to vote. So but there has been some evidence from, I think it's Austria, that has shown that there is an effect on that they... If they turn out at 16, they will continue to turn out. Um, but I can check that, and I'm happy to supply that to the clerks. Okay, that's useful. And coming back to, <clears throat> excuse me, Jenny, Ruth's question about um, schools. I mean, you indicated the example from West Lothian where someone was running an election for pupil councils. Um, I mean, I'm a great fan of pupil councils. When I meet school children, I always ask them about pupil councils and kind of turn some of their questions about democracy uh, back to them. And I get a range of reactions. I mean, it's not strictly within your remit, but do you see there is a would-be benefit in exploring how we could make pupil councils more um, more mandatory, if you like, something that is the norm run to... For example, I mean, you, you do oversee the rules and procedures regarding elections. If pupil councils were something you chose to adopt as something where you would happily have a role in, would you be? Would you embrace that? I think we'd be partly be getting into somebody else's territory because yeah. we're not educationalists. We've, yeah. That's why we've worked with people who are experts in education to deliver this. So I don't want us to exceed our, our remit. However, you know, just off the top of my head, I could imagine it being somewhere where if they put if packs were put together for people about how to run a student council election, that was something I think we would happily kind of help to support. Yeah, that, that, that's the kind of thing I'm thinking of, just, yeah. to be, just to be clear, so that even if they choose not to have one or choose not to run it, at least they can see what kind of good practices and can see the benefits in, in an educational sense um, of people participating in a process that is more structured and formal. I suppose in the sense why we got involved in all of this was because of 16, 17 year olds, obviously. But our role in, the, in providing the educational toolkits for 16, 17 year olds and teachers and such was to kind of bring everyone together and hold the ring and bring our expertise to their world, but it's really the educationalist world which they run, not us. I mean, obviously throughout Scotland, uh, councils run education, they also run elections. I mean, in Highland, Highland Voice has, been, has done things for a number of years. Uh, Aberdeenshire, the, the, the councils in Aberdeenshire, the elections team and the ERO have worked with the schools on several occasions to produce mock elections. I mean, there are examples of councils already working in their own in their own particular way, uh, which we have adv helped and advise. But it's really down to them to do what they want because we don't have a formal role in the curriculum. Yeah. Right, I can understand that. Um, moving on to sort of diversity, you you raise this. Um, do you have a role in improving the diversity of candidates in elections? Uh, well, yes, in the sense that, I mean, for instance, the uh, Access, Access to Elected Office yes. Fund, yeah. uh, which w w is a great success, uh, has a... a Certainly, the people who access the fund, 15 of them actually got elected. Uh, it's, it's been seen to uh, produce a discernible change. Where we came in was how we advised government when they were formulating the legislation to make sure that all of the work which they wanted to do didn't fall foul of the regulatory regime for candidates. Uh, so that was our uh, role in that. We also had a public awareness role in the sense of making sure that people knew about it, so we were all at your various party conferences and trying to ensure people knew about it. Uh, we worked with uh, Inclusion Scotland, who, who organised it, to try and make, uh, to make people aware of it. Mm. Uh, but, our role, in a sense, is really to make sure that whatever the policymakers want and government try and put through in legislation actually works in practice. 
Okay, that's fine. And what, what role does the Commission have? And if it doesn't, who does have this role in ensuring that people with protected characteristics under the Equality Act uh, can register and vote on the same basis as everybody else? Yeah. Sorry, my answer on that. <laughs> well, uh, we, have po we have a role uh, because we advise government. Uh, it would be the government to ensure, well, it's the parliament because they make the law, but the government because they propose the law in that sense to ensure that uh, such people can vote and register. Okay, and is there any work beyond, I mean, the, the act, does it access to... Um, elected office fund has, has been useful, but in terms of other protected characteristics, what initiatives have been taken to improve registration and turnout and candidacy amongst people um, with other protected characteristics? We, within the, um, the law that's, that's set to protect individuals with protected characteristics, we would also work with the EMB and also the um, returning offices in training of people who work end-to-end -end in the electoral system, so electoral registration officers, polling clerks, and so on and so forth. Um, and although the delivery, if you like, the delivery end of that is, is the responsibility of returning officers and registration officers, we work with them to ensure that um, any guidance we put out um, you know, meets the terms of the legislation to make sure that awareness is raised so that people who are delivering those roles at the front end don't have tunnel vision. They, they need to think laterally about being open-minded, see what, uh, you know, how people might need assistance, make sure people aren't being excluded. So as Andy said, within the law that is set by Parliament, our guidance fits within that. Um, training, awareness raising, you know, all the general things to make sure that people understand that it's their democracy. Our role is to make it as accessible as possible, to make sure that the, the rules and the regulations and the guidelines that we're responsible for don't prevent people um, having proper access and fair access. Yeah. The other thing is, in our public awareness work, we, we kind of look at our audiences as... We, well, I should start with, actually, we do a um, significant amount of research into to find out who isn't registered and who is registered, and we can identify groups within that we know to be particularly under-registered and we can target work towards them. So, for example, if you are young you, and you are in private rented accommodation, um, you are much less likely to be registered than if you're older and you own your own house and those kind of things. There are certain minority ethnic groups who are more likely to be under-registered than others. So we can target appropriately, um, and we share all that research, and we make sure that electoral registration officers are aware of that research so they can be looking locally and saying, actually, where are these groups? Where do we need to target our effort? And we, but we all, we split, when we do our public awareness, we split these groups into what we call the incidentals, which are the people who are kind of interested in politics, probably will want to take part. They just haven't quite got round to taking action to get themselves registered. They're the people we target with our kind of, our advertising, things like that, because they're very, you catch them at the right moment, you remind them, especially now that you can register online, it's very efficient. But then we have our other groups, which are the people who actually are disengaged from politics, who aren't going to register, because why would they register if they're never going to vote? And no public awareness campaign is going to... Pick, no 30-second no advert is going to change that attitude. So what we do there is we work in partnership with other organisations who are already trusted and in contact with them. So, for example, we've worked a lot with Shelter over the years to um, get information to um, homeless people or people who are in... in insecure accommodation. Um, an example from um, Northern Ireland was that one of our team in Northern Ireland worked with a local LGBT group and, um, and to um, go around the clubs and pubs in the LGBT community to get information about registration and voting. Um, they also worked in partnership with a travelling group. So, so these are all things that we're open to doing and looking at how we can get those messages out and, and work with those groups. The other thing to mention, I think you'll be talking about this after we've left, so I won't go on too much, is you know, we've, we, we, the anonymous registration, um, the expansion of the anonymous registration, we've supported to make it easy, as easy as possible. for It's not just women, for anybody at risk of violence. And we're going to be working with women's aid and with the police and social workers to make sure we can get guidance out across Scotland to make it more effective. OK. Thank you. Right, OK. If, if it's... A supplementary on that specific point, absolutely, but uh, Monica's been waiting quite patient to come in. Is it on that point? Yeah. Okay. Can I have on that point, it was just, um, you, you mentioned homeless people. Um, 
and you said you work with uh, shelter. I'm just wondering, you know, how how easy it is for homeless people t to register to vote when they haven't got permanent address. It's do you want to? No. Do? Um, they have there's a, a, a thing called declaration of local connection. So um, if you are say you are a rough sleeper, you can register in respect of the park bench that you sleep underneath, and you can pick you you have. Um, you can nominate an address to pick up all your electoral communication. So it could be the local rough sleepers hostel that you name is, and, and, they, and they will correspond, and your, ballot, your poll card will come to there, um, and your you know, postal ballot paper. Mm. I think that, you know, there is an argument if you're a rough sleeper, you probably have other things on your mind, and voting might not always be top of them, but we make sure that you know, working through shelter and, things and other organisations, that people are at least aware that they have an option. Have you done any work on how successful that, that is, that approach? I think there's, um, we don't have, because the numbers aren't collated nationally, I don't think, for declarations of local connections. And they could be for different reasons as well, because it also might be that you're in um, a, me um, a mental health hospital um, and you can register with a declaration of local connection to there as well. Um, but I can... I can Look and see if, if there is any research on how many people use them. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Graham. Uh, Monica Lady. Thanks, convener. Um, good morning. <clears throat> um, following on from Andy Whiteman's questions about people with pr protected characteristics, um, your report from November last year um, on elections for everyone, experiences of people with disabilities, um, which looked at the, the June 2017 UK parliamentary election, um, the report highlights problems that voters with a disability have um, when they vote, but more sort of worryingly, um, the report um, highlights that people with disabilities don't always know about their, their voting rights. Um, why is that? Why do people not know that they, they have a vote? I, th I think that's associated with the general issue of people um, maybe not engaging with, with their, their right to vote. Um, our, our awareness campaigns, uh, which we support, which are run um, largely at local level by returning officers, um, do go out to reach the hard to reach, as it were. Um, they, I suppose, they apply to the general electorate, but also seek to target people who may not know they, you know, that they can exercise their their um, right to vote. So we are actually looking to do some more work with um, organisations that work with people with particular um, disabilities, so RNIB, for example, um, so that we can understand as, as, um, as the Electoral Commission the kind of barriers that people are facing and we can help um, with the voter awareness and the preparation that we do to put um, measures in place to assist those people to come forward and vote. There are um, facilities, um, we were actually just talking uh, yesterday about the um, the readers that are present at polling places to help people um, with um, um, sight impairment to cast their vote, for example, and the extent to which people know that, the, that those are there. Do they know that they're there? Do they know that they're there in every polling place? Um, what's the extent to which polling um, the presiding officers promote that information on the day? So we think right from the, the day that people go to vote, right back to the point at which they decide or wonder whether they're eligible or not. There's kind of a train of, of, of work that needs to be done there to raise awareness across groups that support people with particular needs um, of a specific type, right through to the more generic kind of awareness raising. So, um, you know, we, we do know from, from the turnout figures I mentioned at the outset that more than 50% of people still don't cast their vote. So there's a, there is a big issue about getting people to engage, making sure they understand that it is their right to vote, that they, don't, they have enough information to know that they'll be supported um, when they go. And the point that was raised earlier on about information officers, um, when um, single transferable vote was first in, introduced, there were information officers in all the polling places. And maybe that's something that we should... Um, encourage people to think about doing again because people were nervous about that system and I think it is the fear of the unknown that sometimes stops people going in stepping over the door either to register or to cast their vote 
And we need to work with everybody across the electoral community, returning officers, mm. the electoral management board, registration officers, and of course, um, political parties themselves to get as much information out as possible mm. to make sure that people do feel that they can mm. exercise the, the right that is theirs to exercise. Sorry, Sarah, if you've got anything to add on that. There has been a particular issue with adults with learning disabilities, and, and we, you know, we've done a lot of work over the years with Enable Scotland um, to kind of reach out and to make sure that they're aware that they have a right to vote. Because often it's, we found particularly with adults with learning disabilities, one of the barriers they have is their carers mm. who say, well, you shouldn't be voting, you know, and, and I'm not going to support you to go down to the polling station. So it's kind of reaching out and saying, actually, no, everybody has a right to vote, mm. um, whether you choose to exercise that right or not. And so what we would do is always encourage everybody to be registered and anybody they care for to register them. Because even with cases like, such as dementia, um, we, we've, there's been experiences where care homes have not registered um, people who are living there. And they say, oh, well, you know, they've got dementia. But people with dementia have good days and bad days. And polling day may be a good day. So we say, you know, register everybody. And that gives them the option mm -hmm. if they can exercise it. Enable Scotland made a, a submission to the, the committee back in 2016. I was quite struck by how low... Um, turnout was so they said to the committee that not enough people with a learning disability vote on average is about 30 percent um turnout um but they also said that around 70 percent seven out of ten of people with learning disabilities do want to vote but they find it quite difficult um so you, you've mentioned about the, the role of, of carers and support workers um and how they need to support people but how is that um how could that work be taken forward? I mean, is there anything you can update us on? That, that's by working, like I say, with, with organisations like Enable and others across Scotland to make sure, what we do is make sure they have the information they need to pass out amongst their, you know, if, if they're a care organisation, so they can make sure that they're, that's passed out through, you know, the, care, the carers that they employ. Um, we also make sure that we provide information in Easy Read, and that's something particularly we work with Enable Scotland on this year. Um, and then they were kind of ran workshops with these packs, with these easy read packs to explain how to how to vote. And we're always open to working with mm -hmm. as many organisations as possible to kind of get that information out. Those figures that Enable provided, they were, I think, back in 2016. So do you have any updated figures? Is that monitored? Do you got anything updated on that? No, I think I think uh, Enable Scotland may have because, like I said, they run a big campaign each time, so they they may kind of survey themselves um, themselves, but we can check that. Okay, but aside from Enable having their own data um, in terms of people with protected characteristics, is that can kind of data collected nationally at all? In terms of turnout to vote, it, it can't be because yeah. of the secrecy it's of the ballots. Vote, I mean, yeah. we do when we survey, we can. The, the, the difficulty with asking people whether they voted was they always overclaim. So we'll have maybe turn out a 46.9% percent an election. But when we survey people, 70% claim that they turned out. Now, we know they didn't. <laughs> so um, so, th so that, is, that is difficult. I think the issue with, with those surveys is you wouldn't get enough of the people with protected characteristics potentially in the sample mm -hmm. to be statistically relevant but I'm, I'm what i would have to do is talk to our research team um because they're the experts in this and just ask them what you know potential there is within the, the surveys that they do yeah. to to yeah, track this information from the point of view of how do we know that we're making progress how how is that tracked yeah um, and obviously appreciate the, the secrecy of of the voting process but there, there could be other ways to to capture yeah. that information um one of your recommendations um, has been on um, extending emergency proxy to people who uh, have unforeseen caring responsibilities or um, there could have been a bereavement in, in the family and so on. Um, my understanding is the Scottish Government hasn't taken forward those recommendations as yet. Are you able to give an update or any kind of insight into that? I my understanding is they're still thinking about it, they're reviewing it, the consultation's ongoing. Uh, we, we support it. And it, it, it is, you can practically do it, it's just about testing, you've got to decide who can do what when. Uh, but it, really it's a question you'd have to ask Scottish Government rather than ourselves. Okay. Um, is, that, is that part of the Government's consultation at the moment? 
they talk about proxy? No, I don't think so. Okay, so is so it being re reviewed out with the consultation? Certainly in our response, we'll be raising a number of issues which aren't currently in the consultation, so we'll, we'll certainly raise it with them again. Okay, are there other recommendations that, that you've made that are not in the consultation? Uh, yes. Uh, I mean, for instance, our recommendations about regulation of uh, council elections, the candidate regulation, which we made in 2012, it isn't specifically talked about in uh, the consultation, but we obviously have ongoing dialogue with Scottish Government officials all the time, and it is our understanding that they're looking at bringing in the council elections into the kind of same level of regulation as exists for council elections in England and Wales. Uh, there is you would be aware of the, the various law commissions uh, across the UK published a report on consolidating uh, and modernising electoral law in general. Uh, the Scottish Government uh, have, uh, Joe Fitzpatrick, the Minister, you'll speak to soon, I think, uh, has made commitments to try and bring in uh, much, many of the recommendations in that report uh, to Scottish Parliament elections and Scottish Council elections. I mean, I think in a sense, I know because we're talking to them about it, they're looking at trying to consolidate the electoral rules for Scottish Parliament and Council elections. So there are other things which are around uh, the electoral world which perhaps may not be in this, but that doesn't mean they're lost. OK, thank you. Okay. Um, just before we move on, can I just ask about why the secrecy of the ballot? Sorry if this sounds like a silly question, but bear with me. The secrecy of the ballot stops us getting data on who voted because... It's not a secret whether someone voted or not. It's publicly available information because political parties use something called marked up registers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's more than anecdotal evidence to prove that voting is a habit because if political parties collect the data in an appropriate way, um, they can work out whether someone's voted. If someone's voted in a UK election, they probably voted in a Scottish election and a council by good. If they're voting in a European election, they probably voted in all the elections. Mm -hmm. And you can actually work out pretty reasonably who's likely to vote or not to vote. So it's not a secret whether someone has voted, it's a secret how they've voted. Now we've got attainers who are becoming 16, 17 years old, so we know when they appear in the electoral register, some of that stuff could in theory be tracked through um, and data analysis done to work out. So we know who every 16, 17 year old <coughs> is who had the opportunity to vote, because they all sit in the electoral registers, there's then marked up registers which tells you whether they did or didn't vote. So we've got the data. Why can't we do the analysis of it? I don't understand why the secrecy of the ballot stops us having analysis of how many actually voted. But it's not about how many. It's, it's, I think we were talking very specifically about disabled people, at, I think, right. at that time. So it's right. just, you know, we, we can't, we could identify 16, 17, but okay. we couldn't identify who was disabled, who had a mental health condition uh, is. Um, so you would have to do a huge kind of anonymised survey at the point in which they become attainers and, and all that kind of thing. Yeah. So have we done the data for 16 and 17 year olds then? Do we, have we done that analysis? Do we know how many voted then? We know how many have claimed to have voted, um, but we, we, we haven't gone through the March registers, but we, know, we boosted the sample um, when we did the survey, public opinion surveys after the um, election. We boosted the sample of 16, 17 year olds so we could get a sort of representative. Right. Uh, and 51% of them claimed to have voted at the election. But like you say, people do tend to overclaim um, and it was it was i think comparable with the 18 to 25 right. for the claim turnout so would it just be overly bureaucratic and burdensome to do that exercise and work out exactly how many voted i mean the problem with mock registers is they generally are paper uh, and they're dispersed through the 30, 32 return officers uh, you'd have to collect them up. There's there's no one portal where all the registers are there, so it's, it's not easily an analysable. I mean, you know, uh, you you know who's voted, but you don't know what type of person that is, what the age, if they have disabilities or whatever. It's mm -hmm. just it's just a name. The only people who collect it consistently, in my understanding, is is the parties because you use it in your your campaigning software uh, systems. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean. It would, it would cost a lot uh, okay. in terms of money and resource to do that. Uh, yeah. I, 
I'm not su- I'm not suggesting we should do it. It's just a frustration. It would be good to actually have the data to analyse and work yeah. out what is and isn't been effective. So I was just curious. I, I wouldn't expose that in line of questioning any, any further. Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Convener. We've, we've touched on the role of the political parties in trying to educate uh, the electorate on the, the STV system. And I think that most political parties probably spend more time with the postal voter to trying to educate them uh, than they maybe do with those that turn up on the day. Uh, have you looked at any evidence across other countries that may have a, a sort of a party toolkit that's used to try and manage to see what, what they do and how they, how they get a, a support mechanism? We haven't done any yeah. formal work. Uh, I mean, some parties, vote management strategies, mm-hmm. uh, this, certainly the, some parties struggled with it in 2012, uh, okay. and I think they think they got it better in mm-hmm. 2017. I mean, if you look at, there are very, very few instances of countries using STV. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think if you, if you ask an academic, uh, they would say the best uh, the best vote management strategies take place in Northern Ireland, uh, and you, if you've ever been to Northern Ireland, you'll see a boards outside polling stations which say uh, vote one two three, and somewhere else in the constituency it'll be three two one or whatever, uh, and that's consistent. Now that is they've ra- they've had STV f- for over forty years, uh, they're used to it. There is a particular set of political circumstances in Northern Ireland which may, you know may impact on that. Uh, what we looked at was some of the, and this is why we talk about the, uh, the parties reviewing their strategies, we looked at leaflets, which we all get. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of it was very, very good, and some of it, I know how STV works, I kind of knew what it meant. Uh, whether or not the ordinary voter did, perhaps not. Uh, so the, that is where we're thinking in terms of this, I mean, We've only used SDV for, what, 10, 11 years, uh, which effectively means three goes unless you've had a by-election over that period of time. Uh, so, I mean, it's not embedded in... Everyone knows how to vote under first-past-the-post. STV is slightly different, and you see that with double Xs and threes and three boxes and all this sort of stuff. So it's certainly... I think we're still all on the learning curve, and we've all got a, 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 a part of the job to try and improve how to vote. I think a point which Sarah made earlier, a lot of this is worth doing nearer the time of the polling uh, rather than a long time before uh, because, frankly, people aren't interested in, and, until it, it's front of mind. And, and the knowledge base and the, the training that goes into the polling staff uh, themselves, uh, I mean, I know that's progressed some distance in the short space of 11 years that we've had, uh, but there are still some barriers there that, that, that we find in, and as you say, you've identified certain constituencies and certain wards that are, that are much more susceptible, uh, uh, and, and you may have to have a different focus on how you manage that polling station, how you manage that su- situation to ensure that people yeah. do feel much more comfortable, uh, yeah. because there is no doubt confusion. Yeah. And I think re- the, the opportune or the fortunate situation of Scotland is we have the Electoral Management Board, which the rest of the UK doesn't have. Uh, I think because it, that we're aware that there are certain multi-member wards where if you get a number of nominations, you can then throw a resource at that, yeah. the Electoral Management Board can coordinate amongst the 32 so that it's not forgotten about. Mm-hmm. Uh, before we came into existence, there was lots of things which people wanted to improve about elections, but they forgot because they went off to do their day job within the council. We came along. I think the EMB helps that in a much more operational role because we're kind of much more performance standards and regulatory. Uh, so as, as long as we don't forget that, next time round, we can ensure that certain areas uh, have the right number of information officers in delivering the right number of bits of information. And, you know, we've got past experience of... Uh, pop-ups which explained how to vote and such but in the end of the day it's down to the presiding officer and the poll clerk and once the deputy return officer and the return officer sent them out and trained them it's about delivery now we have people going around checking on how it's happening on the day but you really are uh, relying on the people you've got in the church hall or wherever and you know and your own your own public awareness campaigns you've talked about a 30 second or a 90 second advert Uh, in that space of time you you the message you want to try and get out to try and educate uh, is very limited in the time scale that you have. So, so how, how do you see that developing uh, for the next election, about how you think about processing that information in that short space of time? Yeah. I mean, 
I think Cyril had much more detail, but I mean, it, our TV tends to be much more re uh, registration yeah. or flagging to the information leaflet, which we've sent to all households, uh, which doesn't happen in other parts of the United Kingdom, but because of the different electoral systems such we do that. But also, we're moving much away, much more away from paper to online mm -hmm. stuff, and th this is Sarah's world, so I'm going to be quiet. So, yeah, I mean, one of the things we did this this year, which worked really well with, with um, our younger audience, was um, sort of an animation of an STV count that we used on social media. Because one of the things about understanding about filling your ballot paper complete, uh, correctly is if you understand what's going to happen oh, to your ballot paper... Afterwards, now, in 2007, when STV was first introduced, we actually tested out information that would explain about transfers and things like that. What we found with the general population, particularly the older population, when we tested it, was that they were saying, this is too complicated, I'm not voting. And so actually, so in our main message, we went back to, actually, it's not, this is really simple, it's one, two, three, and so on. But the, the, um, the animations that we did um, on STV for the younger voters um, were worked really well because they were, what we found was the younger voters didn't pick up the leaflet that we sent to every household. That tended to be read, to be read by the older voter, but the younger voter was much more likely to see the animation. And I think the, the answer is, is there's no one size fits all. Because the other thing we, we, you know, there are people who do not have, as I think Citizens Advice have announced this morning, that people still have no access to um, the internet in, in certain communities and, and groups. And so, you know, we, we can't kind of go down that fully digital route, but we just we have to use all of the different of mediums um, that are available to us. Thank you, Camille. Thank you. OK. Well, time's almost upon us, so uh, we'll close this particular agenda item shortly, but just before that, is there anything else that you would like to just put on the record? Any observations, comments before we, before we move on? Just like, well, just like to thank you for the opportunity of coming to to discuss our report and just just to note that the the electoral community in Scotland, as I mentioned earlier, the ROs, EROs, um, you know, the parties themselves, the Commission, I think we do have an opportunity in Scotland to talk together. Often we speak to the political parties panel, we've got an advisory group in Scotland, and we have an opportunity to send out work up and send out consistent messages about raising awareness and the integrity of the poll and so on and so forth. And I think that has helped us to get to this place. Um, none of us are complacent about that, though. And we need to keep um, just keep going, particularly on the voter engagement and awareness um, elements. But I'm grateful to you for the opportunity to come and um, speak about the report. And we welcome yourself and your team coming along to, to, to give evidence on it as well. I think on behalf of the committee, we should point out that we know our specific duties in relation to local government elections, but our, our committee is called the Local Government Communities Committee, yes. and all communities have to engage with elections irrespective of the tier of government and elections. So we don't want to see mission drift, but what we do want to see is make sure our communities are best served by the elections and the election process. So we'll no doubt discuss the committee how we can give some added value and some positive constructive scrutiny to that going forward, not just in the run-up to the 2022 local government elections, but... I would like to think election processes more generally as a committee. So thank you very much for helping us get to grips with some of that. Uh, and we now move to agenda item two. Thank you very much. Uh, but we have to suspend. My apologies. We'll suspend briefly before we move to agenda item two. Thank you very much. Cheers.
Okay, welcome back. We're now moved to agenda item two, which is a piece of subordinate legislation. The committee will take evidence on the draft affirmative statutory instrument entitled the Representation of the People Scotland Amendments Regulations 2018. And in doing so, can I welcome Joe Fitzpatrick, Minister for Parliamentary Business, uh, Roddy Angus, Elections Policy Advisor, and Rebecca White, Team Leader, Elections Sc Scottish Government. Um, the instrument was laid under the affirmative procedure which means the Parliament must approve the instrument before the provisions can come into force. Following this evidence session, the committee will be invited at the next agenda item to consider a motion to approve the instrument. And can I now invite the Minister, uh, Joe Fitzpatrick, to make a short opening statement. Minister. Uh, thanks very much and good morning. Um, thanks for this opportunity to set out the Government's position on the regulations before you today. Their main purpose is to make registering to vote anonymously at devolved elections in Scotland easier. They'll also strengthen the integrity of the electoral register and improve the registration system for electors. As you know, while the Scottish Parliament now has responsibility for local and Scottish Parliament elections, the UK Government remains responsible for UK Parliament elections in Scotland. That means that electoral registration in Scotland is a shared responsibility. Due to this joint responsibility, similar changes are also being proposed for UK parliamentary elections in Scotland. In fact, I understand the UK Government's regulations will be debated in the Commons this afternoon. Anonymous registration was first introduced in 2006 and is designed to protect those whose safety would be at risk if their names and addresses appeared on the electoral register. When applying, an applicant must provide evidence which demonstrates that their safety would be at risk. The evidence accepted is set out in legislation as a live court order, injunction or interdict from a prescribed list or a signed statement certifying that the applicant's safety is at risk, known as an attestation. An attestation can only be made by professions listed in the legislation as qualifying officers, such as a police superintendent or a director of social services. The regulations before you propose to expand the list of who can attest applications. This would also add, they would also add additional court orders which, which um, can be used as evidence to support the application. The two orders which are being added, domestic violence protection orders and female genital mutilation orders, are not orders which are issued by Scottish courts. However, they are included so that these orders can still be used to support an anonymous registration applicant if someone subsequently moves to Scotland. Similar domestic abuse interdicts under Scottish legislation were added to the list of relevant court orders by the representation of the People of Scotland, description of electoral registers and amendments regulations 2013. Further changes are likely to be brought forward as we implement the Domestic Abuse Scotland Bill passed last week and in the light of our ongoing consultation, in particular the detailed policy paper on anonymous electoral registration. On that point, I would urge anyone with a particular interest in anonymous voting to share their knowledge with us and help shape future changes. The consultation on electoral reform and the detailed paper on anonymous electoral registration can both be accessed on the government's website at www.gov.scot and it closes on the 12th of March. The other changes in, in the in the regulations uh, aim to improve the electoral registration process for voters and make it easier and more effective for, le for electoral registration officers to administer. These changes add statements to the re registration applicant application form to alert the applicant that they may have to provide evidence of their nationality and that a failure to provide a previous address may delay their application. In addition, we are proposing to allow registration officers to use information from additional sources to support a decision to remove a deceased elector from the electoral register. This will reduce the need for a registration officer to contact a deceased elector's relatives and help to avoid unnecessary distress to relatives. The final proposed changes streamline and simplify the correspondence electoral registration officers are required to send to electors. These changes are designed to reduce the cost of the registration system and provide greater uh, discretion to electoral registration officers to tailor their approach based on the needs of electors. So I hope you'll agree that, with me that these regulations will make it easier to register anonymously and will improve the registration pro pro process both for the public and administrators. And hopefully that's a, a useful summary and obviously happy to answer any questions. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Minister. I don't think it's lost on on the committee, the timing of, of, of this uh, affirmative instrument. 
given uh, the domestic abuse Scotland bill passed last week, or indeed even the, the debate uh, yesterday afternoon in, in, in relation to 100 years of gaining the franchise for some women in society and the struggles around that. So uh, it's certainly timely and important. Um, just some housekeeping before I, I move to questions on this, just for anyone who, who may, be, may be watching this, who, who isn't used to these parliamentary processes, this is a, a question and answer session at Agenda Item 2 where your officials can take and they can take part in that. Uh, and then there's a formal debate at Agenda Item 3, but in my experience, these things tend to blend into one. So just for anyone watching, just to be aware of that, uh, so they understand the processes we have. So that said, are there any questions for the Minister and his team? Uh, Mr Whiteman. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, what, what prompted these changes? Where, where, where did the idea for making these changes come from? Um, we would already were already planning to introduce changes around anonymous registration in our consultation, which is ongoing, and there is a detailed paper. Um, parallel to that, the UK government, um, prior to us having powers, had consulted on making these particular changes. Um, so, given that, that it's a shared responsibility, I felt it was important that we make these changes now. That's not to say we won't make further changes, and I, I think it is very likely that's why we have a, a continuing consultation. But if we weren't making these changes now, then someone would potentially have to register separately to be on the anonymous register for Scottish and local government elections and Westminster elections. So this is very much about doing what's best for, for the voter. And, and the UK government, is, and presumably, is very supportive of this. It hasn't, from, from UK parliamentary elections point of view, they haven't raised any... No, this, 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 this is a shared shared agenda item, and I, I will go back to my colleagues um, in in the UK government and uh, other administrations across the UK if there are ideas that come out of our consultation, because clearly it is um, it would be better for um, anyone that needs to be anonymously registered that one anonymous registration covers all elections in Scotland. So um, I think that would be the approach we would take is to try and make sure that if, if we want to make further changes here, that they are, are replicated in the UK Parliament in the future to make sure that if someone is um, registered in Scotland on the anonymous registration, then that covers the Westminster Parliament elections as well. Y yes, that's for any changes to the qualifications the for that yeah. following your consultation. But in terms of this particular um, regulation, the UK government is, you know, hasn't had any problems with any of, of this? No, this is... I mean, yeah. I know it only had, I think, 12 responses yeah. to its consultation, yeah. but... I, I think that, that's, that's probably because it, these are pragmatic and sensible things to do. And, and yeah. So I think, I think there's pretty well universal agreement, so we're working together on this. OK, thank you. Okay, any other questions from members? Um, just a, a brief question from me. Um, Minister, I'm just wondering how um, government will work with the Electoral Commission to make sure that, that people are aware of their rights. I'm thinking particularly of um, um, survivors of gender-based violence and how um, um, the role of, of women's aid and other refugees, um, how, how people will get the right information. Because we've heard in a previous session that awareness of people's rights is often a barrier. I think that's a really good point, which is why I would really encourage anyone who has particular knowledge around these matters to all be, all, all be, do the, the whole consultation, but specifically the, the policy paper, uh, the detailed policy paper on, on anonymous registration to, to get involved in that, because we really do want to hear what more we can do, because I think clearly having the right to do something is one thing, but knowing that you have that right is, is equally as important. So I think we'll work not just with, with the, the Electoral Commission, but also with groups like Women's Aid and, and, and other, other groups. Uh, yes, Jenny Minister, just a question with regard to charging uh, for GPs. We assume that only a minority of GPs will charge for their services and it will be in the range of £30 to £63. Pounds. Um, is there a way to stop that? I think the, the number of GPs who are likely to be asked are, are, are slim, but I, and I would hope that a GP who had that experience of, of the individual would realise that, that that was not an appropriate um, charge. Is there a way for us to ensure that they don't do that, though? Because it just doesn't seem right. I think the, the only way it would be able to be done would be as part of the GP's contract. Um, right. So, so there, there potentially is a long... You know, I think we need yeah. to monitor this, and if mm -hmm. going forward we see there's a problem appears and that yeah. um, it just it doesn't mm -hmm. feel right, which I yeah. guess is why you're asking the mm -hmm. questions, and I would hope that, that, yeah. that most GPs would be of the same, same view. OK. OK. Um, can I also just ask, in relation to the uh, relevant professional or officer who can give the attestation to say that uh, the, the person's at risk, so 
the, the rank of police officers been made to be a much more kind of localised police officer. Just for those that are out there just now who maybe uh, report domestic violence and abuse to the police, but then for whatever reason, vulnerabilities, it's never progressed to prosecution and conviction. That information, that intelligence that police officers have can be used to complete that form without ever having had to have secured a court conviction. Yeah, that, that's true. Roddy, do you want to just go a, a bit more yes, detail so if, about even if the police haven't convicted, if they have got circumstantial evidence that would point towards somebody being at risk of abuse, they can sign an attestation. You know, if they feel that it is best for the individual, that that individual needs their identity and location kept secret because they are at risk of abuse, they can assign the, test, the attestation. They don't, there doesn't have to have been a court conviction to I, enable them to do that. I think that's a really important message to make sure everyone understands. I certainly know from individual casework in my constituency that's a really important thing to know. Um, so I, whilst I suspected that would be the answer, I just wanted to, to get that put on the record uh, uh, at the moment. Can I, can I just ask one final question? So it's the granting of anonymity, so the the, the, the address doesn't does not feature on, on 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 the register. Is that for one election? Is it for all elections? Is it for one year? Is it for five years? Is it? I mean, what what what's the the management around that? Well, at the moment, the way the system works is you only have to apply for one once, and that would put you on the anonymous register both for the UK Parliament and the local government elections. This is why that we are making the changes in both the Scottish Parliament and our colleagues down south are doing it in the UK Parliament to keep that the same. Otherwise, you'd be in a situation you'd have to apply twice, there'd be different rules. At the moment, the an anonymous application only lasts for one year and you have to reapply annually. The reason for that is that you can only remain anonymous as long as there is a risk to you of abuse. So if that risk has diminished and is no longer relevant, your name and address would then go back on the register. That would obviously be something that the individual, if they felt at risk, could carry on either through the attestation route or court orders if they thought it was necessary. Uh, is that something we could maybe explore a little bit further? Because I'm, I'm, I'm just hypothecating that there's a vulnerable individual who wishes to exercise their right to vote. There's been really challenging circumstances to get that attestation. Um, it lasts for one year. Are they going to be pre-warned by a, an official that their, yes. that their name will go public again? No, I just think how that could traumatise the individual. Yeah, that, that's not the way it happens. My understanding is that before the year runs out, they get a, a letter from the return, electoral returning officer right. warning them that their anonymous registration is about to run out. So it's a reminder. But that, that's one of the things that we, we can look at going forward as to whether, in terms of the, 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 the consultation, as to whether there's a better way of, of doing that to make that more seamless for, for the person who has, has registered for anonymous registration. I, 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 for a bit of that, Rebecca? In terms of the, the, the consultation about the, the detailed consultation? In terms yeah, of so um, our consultation yeah. includes um, some additional suggestions on extending the anonymous regis registration scheme further. And I think the time limit of the uh, kind of expiry date of, a, of an attestation and um, uh, an anonymous registration would be one area where responses from those who uh, work in the sector or have an interest in it would be very welcome. Um, definitely, there are things we could look at in terms of whether that 12-month uh, sort of sell-by date on it is the most appropriate thing in all circumstances. Mm. But these are, obviously, there's the, the detailed paper um, and, and we are working with a number of the groups um, who have particular interests in this area to try and get any further changes that we decide to make um, in Scotland um, as appropriate as possible. I think I think that's helpful, not for the purposes of, of, yeah. of this particular instrument, which is very clear in what it does, but that ongoing consultation, I think that's maybe something yeah. the government would, would, would definitely have to return to. Yeah. I think Graham Simpson wants to come in at this point. Yeah, just really follow, follow up. Thanks, convener. Um, so if, if someone who is anonymous get, gets a letter um, reminding them that they need, you know, they need to um, renew that. Do they have to go through the same process all over again, or do they just have to return the letter, ticking a box? It's the same process again. They basically have to prove that there is a continuing need for the anonymity. Right. So, 
I, I think you're highlighting an, an area where we can clearly potentially make further further um, changes here to improve further. But today's order is about making sure that we have a system in place that provides the best possible yeah. um, protection for sure. the, the individuals. Rather than other members could make some other questions on that, there's other observations I would like to make, but technically we're supposed to have a debate after the questioning, so I'll just hold and sit tight until we get to the formal debate part, if you like. Are there any other questions to the Minister and his team? Because you will have the opportunity to put one or two remarks on the record when we get to the debate. Yeah, I think it's just to reinforce the, the point and question that, that Jenny Gilruth made, because if it's going to be an annual, you know, reoccurring event, you know, if if your GP is the, the most accessible person and that becomes a, a recurring charge, so I think that, that would be something, you know, certainly I would be keen for, for that to be looked into, um, you know, perhaps with the, the Cabinet Secretary for, for Health, because that, that would be a significant barrier to people. Yeah, no, I think that's a reasonable. Thank you. Uh, I don't see any other questions. I think this is a particularly helpful question and answer session. I feel it's what we're actually doing in the debate that we come to in a second. Hopefully a short debate, but a debate we'll come to in a second may actually help inform some of the government's thinking around that future work and consultation that's that's ongoing. So we will now move to agenda item three, which is still uh, subordinate legislation. For this item, the committee will formally consider motion S5M10205 <laughs> calling for the committee to recommend approval of the draft representation of the People of Scotland Amendment Regulations 2018. Uh, only the Minister and members may speak in this debate, so unfortunately your officials can't take part in this. Uh, and can invite the Minister to speak and to move motion S5M10205. OK, well, uh, obviously to formally move the, the motion, um, thank the committee for their questions. I think, as always, they are helpful and will help us in um, any any future changes that we decide to make. Um, the committee will notice that uh, a number of the areas that you've previously looked at um, are now appearing in our consultation as things that we are, we are um, looking to see how we can take forward. So... Um, just formally move the, the motion. Yeah. Thanks, Minister. I'll make a few observations and then bring my colleagues in if there's anything you want to, to, to add, add at this point. I think we were right to explore the the, the, the length, the time period that the anonymity would, 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 would last for. Um, so I think it's only fair to make some observations around when you get towards the end of that year, what would happen if the person doesn't respond to the letter? I'm not always very good at responding to letters that come in through my letterbox in the house, let alone something I might be wanting to block out of my mind because of, you know, pain, turmoil, stress, traumatisation. So that issue about what happens if the person doesn't reply to the letter, does the, does the, does the returning officer, does the letter officer then... Uh, I'm not asking to answer this question, but just some careful thoughts going forward about the transition between if it's not to be extended beyond one year what that transition looks like and unintended consequences if vulnerable individuals don't reply or don't engage with that. Uh, certainly, um, that annual uh, need to reapply, um, anyone who's looked at post-traumatic stress disorders will know that re-traumatisation can be very, very real. So I think the health and emotional needs of the individual has to be quite clearly taken into account when looking at arrangements around that. But I'm conscious that's not... What we're here to approve today, what we're appear to, here to approve today is a good, solid thing that I think we should all sign up to, but just putting some of those observations on the record for the consultation that is ongoing. I don't know if any of my colleagues want to come in and add anything to that during what is a, a, a formal debate opportunity. <coughs> there have been no one else wanting to come in on that. Uh, can I invite... Uh, the minister to to sum up and to respond to the debate. Okay, well just uh, again, thanks very much for your feedback, particularly the point about what happens after 12 months. Um, we've got a note of that, and we'll make sure that features strongly, and we get um, feedback from um, organisations who've got particular interests and re registration officers about how we how we whether there's changes we can make in the future there. Um, but thanks very much for um, the, the questions. Okay, and thank you to you and your officials. So we'll now move. Uh, to the vote. Uh, so the question is that motion S5M10205, in the name of the Minister for, par for Parliamentary Business, be approved. Are we agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Um, so the committee will report on the outcome of this instrument shortly. So I think that's an administration exercise, and I have to inform on the record that we will do that. So thank you very much for, for coming along. Uh, we'll suspend briefly before we move to agenda item four. Thank you, Minister, and thank you to your officials. Thank you. Thank you.
OK, we now move to agenda item four, which is the Planning Scotland Bill. And committee members will report back on their community engagement events as part of the Planning Scotland Bill. Our consultation, um, our call for evidence and that has, has, has recently closed, but we're continuing uh, community outreach to, to get as many views as possible in relation to that. So I'm going to invite uh, some of our committee members who were out and about talking to communities over the last few days to report back formally to the committee. Can we go to Andy Whiteman first? Andy, could you tell us about your visit? Thank you very much, um, convener. Uh, yes, so uh, myself and um, Jane Williams, clerk to the committee, and uh, Alan Rafish from Parliamentary Research went to Island of Skye. We met 13 people uh, on Monday evening, five community councillors and seven representatives from community groups. And first of all, I want to thank them for coming uh, in a rural area like Sky. They have to travel some distance to get there. Um, so it was a very useful meeting, and I'm very grateful to them for uh, committing to the time and sharing their perspectives on the planning system. Uh, we had a fairly wide-ranging discussion, and I suppose I just want to highlight four themes that we got a sort of broad consensus at the end uh, were, were, were critical. The first is on the question of the proposed local place plans, and there were concerns amongst um, uh, representatives there about resourcing uh, of these plans, about whether there would be kind of templates and formats um, that could be uh, uh, used, about training uh, for people who would be expected to uh, draw these up. That would be either community councils or community bodies as recognised under the Community Empowerment Act. Uh, and, and most of those people will be, will be volunteers and not be used to participating at this uh, level in the planning system. Um, and there was, I think, broad consensus that if these local place plans are to be meaningful and if the time uh, required and asked of essentially volunteers um, is to be uh, given, then their status should be reasonably strong. Um, and I think there was broad concern that it should they should have local planning authorities should have more than simply regard to um, these local place plans so there was i think a broad welcome for the concept if they were um, well resourced and if they were to become a meaningful part of the planning system i think that's a, a fair summary of where people were at um, another point was around uh, delivery and i think it's important to point out in this context that we went to a rural area, and in a rural area like Sky, a lot of people are not so much concerned about controlling or inhibiting development, as can be the case in urban areas. Um, they want stuff to happen, and um, they want housing um, for people in relatively uh, isolated and small communities. So their frustrations were more around the fact that we can have a local development plan, but it's not implemented. Um, and, for example, land is made available where the landowner wants it rather than where the plan says. Uh, there are broader contextual issues around crofting tenure, etc. But there was a concern around the ability to do a good plan, but then to get it implemented. And that's in relation to getting hold of the land and actually doing the stuff that people have agreed that they want to do. So that was a concern. On uh, the question of third party right of appeal came up, um, and I think it's fair to say there were mixed views on that. Uh, there wasn't a great deal of enthusiasm for it. There wasn't a great deal of opposition. And I think that probably reflected the fact, again, that these representatives were coming from groups who wanted stuff to happen. Uh, that was their principal concern. Uh, so, yeah, I won't go any further than that. I think that's probably the dominant themes that we teased out towards the end of our meeting. But we took a, a full note of what was said and... Uh, a draft of that will be sent to participants um, for their comment and, uh, as I understand, we'll be publishing a note of the of the meeting as a whole. So, finally, thanks again to everyone who turned out. I think it was a very useful initiative as part of our scrutiny of the bill. Thank you very much. Uh, Andy, uh, can we turn to Monica Lennon next, please? Monica. Thanks. So, yes, I was part of the delegation to, to Motherwell, which uh, wasn't exactly a, a tour for me. It was just 10 minutes along the road, um, but it was a really good um, turnout. I think the the discussion with the chief planner, John McNearney, from the Scottish Government, I think warmed people up 
and it got people thinking about um, you know what, what the purpose of the bill is and and, and what it could achieve because um, I think it's fair to say there was a varying degree of knowledge about the bill and about the planning process in the room um, we had a mixture of um, people there um, not all from community councils but um, the experience of community councils was coming across quite strongly I think what was um, you know, kind of a consistent from all the, the speakers who took part was that they want to have influence. You know, they want to be part of decision making and they see the importance of planning, um, not just in the immediate term, but decisions around individual applications or the direction of travel and a development plan can really shape their community um, for some time to come. And there were people there who also had experience of applications like incinerators that don't really respect um, a community council boundary. You know, there you were know, people there from right across Lanarkshire um, who've been working together across local authority boundaries. So that was an interesting um, dynamic. In terms of local place plans, because that's something that the chief planner um, talked about and explained and took some questions on. So um, on the one hand, people felt that sounded quite positive. It was bringing some additionality. But there was also a bit of um, just people weren't really sure how does that fit with the development plans. I think people understood that we have a plan-led system and understood the, the desire to keep the integrity of the plan-led system, but they weren't sure um, if the development plan is working well, why you'd need to come in and try and, and, and change that. So the chief planner talked about that might be an indication that the plan, which as we know would move to a 10-year cycle rather than a five-year cycle, is in need of a refresh, but people were wondering if, if a number of um, local place plans come forward, how would that be managed? Um, who is the community um, where you don't have a community council? Who could initiate that and bring that forward? And as Andy has touched on, how how is that resourced? And ultimately, what weight is attached to that? It's not formally adopted, it's part of the development plan. But nonetheless, people were interested. Um, they were asking how it fits with community empowerment and locality plans. So it felt there was like a, you know, um, a bit another layer of planning that, you know, perhaps, you know, wasn't, uh, wasn't required. Um, the chief planner talked about the performance of planning and about how we can speed up the process and have more people involved. But there was a feeling that there was, um, there weren't that many measures to look at outcomes and quality of place. So there's a lot of talk about the quality of housing, but I think people were meaning just the quality of their environment more generally. Um, on the issue of appeals and equalising um, the appeal process, again, there was probably mixed views on that. Um, the, the point that the government, I suppose, had made about they want to improve the, the system at the, at the beginning. Um, people were familiar with the pre-application consultation process and, you know, that kind of, I suppose, the, the jargon around front-loading. But people were given examples of going along to these meetings in a community centre on a Saturday morning and feeling that they had given input and ideas and feedback. But when a formal application came in, that wasn't really reflected. So again, they felt that whilst they were um, taking part, th they weren't really an equal partner at that stage. So there was a bit of frustration that if you have a plan-led system and the developer is, is trying to get something that's contrary to the plan, should they have the opportunity to appeal that when the community doesn't have that appeal um, option? So again, it's obviously it's not something that's covered in the bill, but it's something that people clearly want to talk about and I think again people recognise that the planning system is very enabling you know it is a very sort of pro-development it's not an anti-development system that we have so in some of the the constraints in terms of getting houses built and getting infrastructure in place people in our group didn't really feel that that was um, the fault of the planning system as a, as a barrier per se they were talking about um, just other issues um, in terms of finance and infrastructure, not being able to, to get to your GP, the local schools at capacity. So they felt there was other barriers in terms of infrastructure and amenities that made it difficult to make um, development viable. And that was stopping um, the, the house builders perhaps from going forward rather than a lack of um, planning consent or 
um, encouragement in the planning process. So it was a really, really good exercise. Obviously, there was a lot more covered, and Graeme and I were in different groups, so perhaps Graeme would want to add to that. Well, very much the, the same themes, really. Um, a, a good mix of people um, around my table from uh, community councils, community groups, um, somebody from Lan Lanarkshire Death, Death Club, um, and there was a, a chap uh, representing one of the ethnic min minority groups, uh, was, uh, and, and somebody from Motherwell FC Trust as well. Um, so it was co quite a good mix. <coughs> But the same themes, um, really concerns about um, lack of community engagement and how, in their eyes, the, the, the bill doesn't improve that. Um, concerns over the local place plans, uh, as Monica says, uh, people fearing that, and, and again, as, as Andy made the point, people fearing that these place plans wouldn't really have enough teeth. Um, so if people go to all the trouble of preparing one and a council only has to have regard to it, it, it can then uh, put it on the shelf and pretty much ignore it. So there's concern over that. Um, strong concern in my group um, around um, third party rights of appeal. Um, people wanting it, not concern about it, people wanting it. Um, a very strong feeling that the current system is weighted one way, um, and that's a, that probably reflects the experiences of the the people on my table. Um, there was also a, a concern around the simplified development zones and um, a worry from the participants that I spoke to that this could give a carte, carte blanche to uh, developers. Now, that, that could be a good thing or a bad thing, but there was a, certainly a, a concern around that. Um, so I think those are the three themes that I picked up on. Yeah, if I just add that, yeah, simplified development zones, um, that was also raised and, and, and people, I think, felt a little bit surprised um, that that would have a rollback planning controls. The, the other point I didn't mention, and I don't think Graeme did either, was just around resources. So people we're feeling that um, it's not just about um, the workload that, that the planners have. They were recognising that there's pressure, you know, in local government in terms of the input from the roads department, environmental protection and so on. Um, so there was just a sense that I think in those areas um, there's been a reduction in the number of um, local offices you can visit because there's only one um, office now for South Lancashire and North Lanarkshire. So there was just a feeling that it's just a wee bit harder to get information. So there was a, a bit of discussion about planning fees. Um, is the system properly resourced? Should the planning fees be higher? But there was no settled view on that. OK, uh, thank you to members for that. Uh, I had the privilege to go to Stonehaven uh, and attend uh, a meeting at Mackey Academy. <laughs> uh, 12 attendees from the community, predominantly from community councils, but there was also reps from Development Trust in the third sector there. I think there was one local business person there as well, um, all giving their views. Uh, thanks to the parliamentary team who, who attended and resourced that, uh, and, and, but also to two members of the Bills team who were meant to be there at the start just to give a brief overview of the legislation but stayed for the whole two hours plus event so thank you to them for doing that but most of all of course thank you to the attendees from across uh, that that whole area who came along to give their views so I'll try to to summarize the different strands as, as other members have done in relation to their thoughts um, we kind of started off a discussion around local place plans but i think it's fair to say um concerns and opportunities and that's two sides of the same coin really so for example keen to know well, what do we mean by a community in the first place for a local place plan? How do we define the community? Will that community be really representative uh, when they do their consultation? Will all parts of the community to be will be engaged with it? One person gave the example, you could consult with 25% of the entire community, but they could also all be over 45 and you haven't engaged with younger people within the community. So how do you make sure you're when you're doing your community consultation to develop local place plans that you are actually um, leading and shaping that on behalf of the community. Not a barrier, but certainly a, a danger and a concern that, that, that some 
some some people have. Uh, also, I think as we've heard another theme coming up about once a local police plan has been developed, uh, how will the local authority uh, take account or give regard to that in a meaningful way? In other words, I mean, I, I think people were realistic, didn't expect the council to say this local police plan is now a local development plan, but there should be some connection between the local police plan and the council's development plan to show how one has impacted and helped shape the other. So I think that's a reasonable uh, thing to put on the record. Which then brought us to local development plans more, more generally. Um, and there was a feeling that perhaps uh, local authorities don't cover themselves in glory at the moment and how they consult and engage with communities in relation to uh, local development plans. So if we're going to lock in a local development plan over a longer period of time now for 10 years, a, a real keenness to make sure that the communities are properly and actively engaged in some of that, not just the local place plans, but actually the development plan as well. There was some brief chat about how uh, community planning would fit within, within that process uh, uh, as well. Um, there was also a general theme when we asked what do you want from the planning process. Transparency was a word that came up quite a lot. Um, not always defining exactly where you want the transparency, but transparency more generally is a theme within the planning and development process certainly came up. Uh, and a couple of people were interested about how delegate, delegated powers, i.e. planning approval by officials, would or wouldn't be used and whether or not that would... Uh, uh, potentially alienate uh, that democratic link between uh, councillors voting in a planning committee and communities and that accountability. So there was some talk about uh, about that. Um, also some talk about just planning applications more generally. Of course, welcoming the, the kind of front-loading of consultation and the pre-consultation, but actually asking the question, well, what does that look like? Will it be meaningful or will it be a tick box exercise? Um, who decides whether that has been meaningful or whether it's been a tick box exercise? What would that look like? Who monitors performance around that was 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 mentioned as well. Simplified planning zones <coughs> did did come up. Um, and just by by the terminology, I think there was concern that does this mean developers can just pitch up and do what they like kind of thing? And when that was teased out a little bit more, um, it, it was perhaps more about, well, simplified planning zones as long as the community has an input into shaping as to where they might be and what they might look like and what the purpose would be. So that, yes, maybe simplified planning zones, but concerns that it shouldn't just be a green light for development. It should be more about the community, the local authority and developers, if you like, co-producing what that might look like rather than a developer-led uh, process. Finally, some general chat about um, Section 75 monies, planning gain monies, how well they are or aren't used at present. Some discussion, um, particularly from one individual, about the infrastructure levy, where the power to take, the power to have the levy will be within the bill, uh, and some nervousness around whether that would be overly burdensome on developers, but I think it's fair to say other people would say we do need the infrastructure for sustainable development, but it's just to give a balanced view of what we heard, because not all 13 people in that room are necessarily going to agree with each other, neither should they agree with each other, but I think that probably teased out most of the themes, so uh, I'd just like to say again thank you for everyone that took the time to not just uh, attend the meeting I held, but actually meetings across the country that all all, all the members uh, uh, attended and consulted with. Before we move on from this particular agenda item, would any other member like to make any brief comments at this point? I stress brief, but not all members were able to attend those visits, so it's just the opportunity. Would anyone else like to put something on the record? Andy. Sorry, yes, thank you. Just to supplement what I said following other uh, members, there were, there were two other issues that were raised which will come out in our summer, but I think were quite important. I mean, one was we had a representative from the local um, access panel, um, and she was very, very clear about improvements that need to be made in the planning system around access for disabled people. Um, some quite powerful testimony about the difficulties. Uh, and the other is around the simplified development zones. Um, we had two people there who basically had been working up schemes for affordable housing uh, at the north and the south end of Sky. Uh, housing associations, local people are on board, tenants, land, money, all sorted. 
Um, but then when it went through the formal planning procedure, uh, objections from statutory consultees and problems. And in those circumstances, the idea of simplified development zones appeared, this was just an initial because people were obviously new to this, um, appeared quite an attractive option because they saw it as a means by, by which a lot of these stuff could get sorted out up front. And then as soon as it was agreed, boom, they were free to do what they wanted to do. Uh, so potentially quite an interesting vehicle, I think, in those kind of circumstances. And they also saw it as an example. Uh, the council would insist on a standard, design standards of street lighting, uh, which are appropriate for urban areas, but they don't want them. They like dark skies, um, and there's the dark light effect, and they just don't want that. And roads, standards of roads, they don't need tarmac roads. Gravel's perfectly sufficient. And these things were all frustrations uh, for them, which they saw this as potentially a, a mechanism for overcoming. Okay. Um, very interesting. That is now on the record, even though there will be a formal note produced of, of each of the meetings. Uh, I, I think that probably disposes of what we want to put on the record in relation to Agenda Item 4. So thank you to members for participating in that. We now move to Agenda Item 5, which has previously been agreed will take in private. So we now move into private session.